Kristen, great to have you on the show today. Thanks for being with us. Thanks so much, Morgan. It's great to be here. So well, this is a question I think so many companies across so many industries have been grappling with in recent weeks, and that is how to, I guess, a address and adjust operations in Russia and in, in, in the region. So given the fact that you are scaling back some of those um, businesses, but leaving other ones intact, what has gone into that decision and why? Sure. I mean, first and foremost, um, you know, we condemn the attacks um, on Ukraine from Russia um, in the strongest of terms. And our first focus is on our colleagues uh, and their health and safety. We obviously have a number of colleagues um, in Ukraine, and we're focused on trying to do what we can to uh, keep them safe, help them evacuate if they need. Uh, we also have do have business in Russia, but thankfully we do not have any manufacturing operations uh, there. We do not sell uh, to the government. And we are selling medicines and vaccines uh, for animals. And so this is, you know, really an essential industry, even under OFAC guidelines. So, you know, it is a, obviously a tricky time, but we're always guided by our purpose as a company to nurture the world and humankind by advancing care for animals. And our, our business there is focused on livestock and making sure there can be a safe food supply. So, you know, it, it is obviously challenging times, but our purpose is really what grounds us. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, there has been all this focus on supply chains. And then when we talk about livestock specifically, that is its own supply chain. And we are seeing what's happening to food prices, for example, the world over right now. So I, I just wonder when when you see something like livestock in the breadbasket of Europe impacted right now, what does that do in terms of the demand for animal health, which I'd imagine becomes even more crucial? Sure. Um, we make products for both pets and livestock. The majority of our business uh, is in the pet care side, and that's not something that I think you'll see a significant effect on. Is certainly if you looked at uh, the last two years and even recessionary times, pets have done well. But to your point on livestock, obviously an increase in input costs for wheat and for corn will impact livestock globally. Um, I think there's been reports that you've been having over the last few days on just what could happen to corn prices or wheat prices and what that really means for livestock producers around the world. It probably means an increase in the price of meat at the, you know, at the grocery store as well. So we really have to support our customers uh, through that transition and look at it globally. We're a very diverse business. Um, you know, across many different markets, across many different species. So we've been able to weather these um, these shocks um, many times over the last 10 years, um, and we think we can continue to do so. And, and just to turn back to Russia for a moment, I realize it's not necessarily a very large market um, for, for Zoetis products per se, and you're not manufacturing there, but just in terms of how you're thinking about business or operations in that country in general, I mean, do you think of it with sanctions afoot and on a conflict going on? Do you think of it as a halt or you think of it as a potential exit for the business? And I ask that because Russia has basically suggested that it could seize assets of, of businesses that stop that stop doing work in the country. Sure. We make essential vaccines for everything from livestock um, to pets. We don't have manufacturing oper operations there. We have halted all investment in the market and promotional activities in the market as well. Uh, so essentially, we're selling to livestock producers uh, who still require that to ensure they have, you know, healthy animals. So that's really where we are. We're obviously going to follow any sanctions that the government puts into place. But as you know, even in many sanctioned countries, essential medicines and vaccines are normally exempt from that. So we'll follow the, the guidance that the government has. We don't have any large assets there. So, um, you know, and it's not a large market, as, as you mentioned. It's less than 1 percent um, of our revenue. Kristen, it's David. You know, I wonder, are you through the impacts of COVID? And I mentioned it on both sides, sort of, of your business, positive and negative. We know so many people who uh, uh, adopted pets. Uh, but we also know there was a lot of absenteeism and veterinary practices that perhaps prevented people from getting uh, their pets taken care of in a, in a timely manner. Is it over? Uh, well, I think we've all... Uh, I never know when COVID's over. It seems to evolve itself constantly. And I think some of its lasting effects will be with us for a long time. So what we saw during COVID was how important that human-animal bond really is. And it was, it was critical. People adopted more pets. They spent more time with their pets. And the more time they spent, the more they noticed um, about what was going on with their pets and the more they increased pet spending. So even if you look at this year, I don't think we're exactly out of it, but if you look at you know, some of the early months, we still saw an 8% increase in sales in veterinary clinics. Um, a lot of that's been driven by increased spend um, per pet, which is driving it. But these pets aren't going anywhere. If anything, they're going to age. And most importantly, we're bringing significant innovation to the market around monoclonal antibodies, parasiticides, dermatology, 
that's going to be increasingly important as many of these pets age. So I think this is a trend that's going to obviously, you know, continue. People are spending more time at home still, even if they're returning to work a few days a week. And so pets will remain increasingly important.